Hey friends, welcome back. It's Mike here with High Intensity Health. So as you know by now, Jalen Michaels is out there trashing the ketogenic diet. Keto. And like, I don't know if anybody is as old as me in this room, but that diet used to be called Atkins. <laughs> and I normally don't make videos like this, but because the science was botched so much, and I do have a master's degree in human clinical nutrition, I felt compelled, obligated to break down some of the things that she said and just share them with you. And so that you can understand a little bit more of the clarity and the context to things that she speaks about, like the telomeres, she talks about cell membranes, she talks about free radical stressors. She also talks about the ketogenic diet being a state of um, an emergency. And so let's just start off with that. And let, let me just uh, back up a little bit. Okay, so there's a few ways to get into ketosis. Obviously, you can eat a low carbohydrate diet which I'll take a side small step. She does say that, you know, you have to have under 20 grams of carbs per day. But that's actually not true in a lot of people that have been doing this for a while. You uh, initially, when you first start on keto, yeah, you might need to really slam down your carbohydrates or go on a zero carbohydrate diet initially while your, your metabolism is kind of reprogramming itself metabolically, epigenetically. That's one beneficial aspects of the ketogenic diet is ketones made by your liver they affect your body metabolically and also epigenetically. So it's like a metabolic software upgrade within your body. Just like when your phone gets a new software update, literally your metabolism, your immune system, your neurologic system gets a software update in the presence of ketones because they are pleiotropic, meaning they communicate throughout the body. They're not just swapping out sugar for ketones, right? There, there's much more to the diet than that. And that speaks to what we're gonna talk about shortly. But there's many ways to get into ketosis lowering your carbohydrates as she alluded to, but fat adapted athletes, for example, like myself, I can have north of 90 grams of carbs per day and still be in ketosis as long as I exercise. So keep that in mind. So low carb diets, exercise, and fasting or time-restricted feedings are the primary ways outside of pathologic or disease states that one can be in ketosis. So Julian, you may not have tested your ketones yet, and based upon looking at your body type and the type of exercises that you do, I would bet that in the post-workout window at a minimum, even though you do eat a lot of meals. Eating every three to four hours, breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner in particular. Which is kind of goes against the whole keto thing. You are in ketosis, at least would have 0 0.5, 0 0.6 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone, elevated in the post-workout window. So with all due respect, Jillian, I think you're being a little incongruent here when talking about all the, the problems associated with keto when we know that physically active exercisers, even if they are high carb, we know that one of the body's metabolic responses in a post-workout window to spare glucose and to replenish glycogen is to raise ketone bodies. And so, so we know that data. So sorry, Jillian, you're a little bit incongruent there. Uh, next thing, you talk about feeding windows in one of these videos where you talk about autophagy. That process of autophagy, where we call the dead cells, turns on healthy tissue. And the words verbatim that she used is culling your old cells, which we wholeheartedly agree on this channel. Anyone that covers nutritional ketosis or intermittent fasting talks about autophagy as one of the mechanisms that's ascribed to being in a fat adapted state because we know that in the presence of glucose, in the presence of insulin, which by the way would negate making ketones, uh, those mediators also help the body become increase autophagy from a signaling standpoint, right? So uh, if you're interested in autophagy and the anti-aging or the health-promoting benefits that autophagy garners to the body, uh, you're gonna achieve that more readily if you're in a ketogenic state versus eating the meals that she's referring to. And by the way, I do wanna talk about the fact that she does in, make some separation between fasting and time-restricted feeding. Um, so I, I do want to keep in mind that she did kind of emphasize that, but she, she was very, uh, in some of the videos, talking about starvation and how ketosis induces starvation. And it throws your body into a state of emergency. That's what ketosis is. Um, and just, just as you all know, for those of you that have been keto or tried ketosis, ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, they tend to affect the appetite sensing systems within the hypothalamus uh, in certain ways, they affect leptin signaling so that you're not hungry, 
even though you may be in a caloric deficit, um, you, you don't feel these the hunger cues that you would if you just slam down your calories and you have like a bodybuilding style, high protein, high carbohydrate, low fat diet, right? That is going to be uh, simulating more hunger cues and, and inducing that sense of starvation much more than say a ketogenic diet. So, so that's kind of interesting that research is out there. So let's go back to the autophagy that she was referring to. And, and this is a, a, a good point. Okay, so she mentions in her feeding windows in her new book, she talks about breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. So that's six meals. Okay, so we know from research in the 1980s, the metabolic flexibility data, that in the presence of insulin, the body becomes more metabolically inflexible and it favors burning carbohydrates. Okay, okay. So that means it's going to be harder to burn more body fat for fuel. And we know that 71% of American adults are either obese or overweight. And so people are trying to lose body fat. So eating the way that she's suggesting to eat, uh, even if it is real whole food or things along those lines, guess what? You're not going to be burning body fat in appreciable amounts that you would want. Okay. And that's where keto is unique. And this is what we talk about in the ketogenic diet community is compressing your feeding window and not having breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, you know, all these things. We're talking about having maybe one or two meals a day compressing that feeding window. It's called time-restricted feeding. We've done videos with Jason Fung, with many other experts, Don D'Agostino, about that, okay? She talks about telomeres. She talks about free radical stressors. So we're seeing that diets rich in saturated fats are poor for our telomeres. Oxidative stress, increased inflammation, uh, your nutrient sensing pathways that are related to the health of your metabolism are overrun with constant food, heavy fats, lots of animal protein, and on, we know it hurts your telomeres, and on and on and on. You know, if you, if you really look uh, from a biochemical standpoint, break down burning carbohydrates for, utilizing carbohydrates for energy versus, you know, fats for energy, uh, the, the efficiency within the hydrocarbon chains of the fatty acids, whether it's your own body fat, animal fat, plant-based fats, whatever the a ketogenic diet, a lot of fat, that is much more efficient and going to produce less metabolic and oxidative stress. Okay. It's, that's well known. That's why so many people in the anti-aging community literally talk about, they talk about this, the low carb, high fat diet really kind of stimulates or stimulates or mimics the metabolic effect associated with calorie restriction without having to undergo calorie restriction, right? And so we know states of calorie restriction are associated with glucose deprivation, reduce insulin and IGF-1 signaling, reduce mTOR signaling. That's how, you know, they are linked with less incidence of cancer and neoplasm and, and growth along those lines, also chronic inflammatory disease. So that's what's unique about the ketogenic state is it mirrors or mimics the metabolic you know, profile that we see when people are calorically restricted chronically, which might have some longevity promoting effects, but of course has negative effects long-term when it comes to losing body fat. And of course, Jillian, you know, the follow-up studies from The Biggest Loser show that guess what? These individuals regained a lot of the weight that they lost and more. This is called adaptive thermogenesis, where the body, when you lose, when you calorie restrict, when you overexercise, when you do all that, the body's resting metabolic rate declines. And guess what? You regain what you lost plus some. And some studies show that that metabolic rate never actually goes back to normal. Whereas research is now emerging in ketogenic diets, in intermittent fasting studies compared to calorically restricted individuals, their resting metabolic rate does not get suppressed in the post weight loss window when you intermittent fast or you're in a ketogenic state. So again, linking starvation to ketosis and all that, this emergency response, not really true, okay? We know that neonatal babies, babies in the utero, you know, again, time-restricted feeding or fasting or exercising are all ways to induce ketosis, right? Ketosis is a natural phenomenon. Your liver makes ketones. Um, in, a, in a video that she did with Josh Axe, and this, uh, again, makes me think she kind of does, doesn't understand how ketosis works. I don't believe in keto. I think it's hard on the kidneys and the liver. And he was able to explain to me the benefits and how, how it should be done. She talks about how ketosis is hard on the kidneys uh, and the liver. And it's, it's actually healthy for the liver because you're taking 
what, when people are having a lot of carbohydrates, they undergo de novo lipogenesis within the liver. And so their liver is starting to accumulate a lot more fat. And that's why we see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. These are two forms of you know, progressive liver disorder due to excessive fat accumulation within the liver. That's happening from carbohydrates. That's not happening from fats. That's not happening from ketones. In fact, when you're in a ketogenic state, your liver is actually taking fat from the liver and, and making ketones. That's where ketone synthesis occurs. Lastly, let's talk about um, the antioxidants. I think this is really important. She talks about how eating animal protein, eating fats create a lot of oxidative stress. This is free radical mediated stress. And last thought on keto, we're stripping our body of certain fruits <laughs> which have a ton of antioxidants and polyphenols in them. So again, when we look at oxidative stress and free radicals and how they're aging us, we need to look at antioxidant foods that help to combat that. When you start cutting out digestive enzymes in papaya, and pineapple and mango. As we alluded to now, uh, this this entire throughout this you know ten minute video and whatnot, when you're burning primarily fat for fuel, it's actually much more efficient from both an energetic standpoint, meaning how much um, you know compensatory. Like it has to do with it gets complex, but the NAD to NADH ratios, how much of like a uh, electron donor is needed to mitigate um, some of the free radicals that are, are, you know, the imbalances within the oxidative stress. Suffice it to say, the, the the balance of oxidative stress when you burn fat for fuel versus glucose favors fat burning. It's more efficient. There's less metabolic waste. There's less free radicals generated. And you preserve the NAD to NADH ratio. And that's why so many different longevity scientists, people looking at the mechanism of action of the ketogenic diet, are excited about ketones and burning fat for fuel because it preserves your cellular battery. And that has to do with the overall oxidative burden within the body, okay? So again, if you wanna fast track aging, accelerate aging, create free radical stress, then you, you wanna consume more carbohydrates because they tend to deplete the NAD to NADH ratio. And that again, it involves glutathione status, it involves true radical stressors, it involves the antioxidant response elements. And she does speak to nutrient sensing receptors uh, within the body uh, in a ill regard, saying the ketogenic diet affects negatively nutrient sensing receptors. And I think she was maybe referring to, you know, some of them, uh, adenosine monophosphate kinase, AMPK. This is a no nutrient sensing receptor that's upregulated in fat adapted individuals and people that exercise and people that fast and people that eat a low carb ketogenic style diet, right? It's linked with longevity. It's linked with the downstream, all these positive downstream uh, beneficial metabolic properties. You don't get AMPK upregulated. This is a, a main nutrient sensing receptor. PGC1 alpha is another one. mTOR is another one. You don't necessarily get the positive benefits of these nutrient recepting sensors that are linked with longevity eating a high carbohydrate diet. And so I'll just leave it with one more thing. She talks about uh, oxidative stress, free radical stressors. She talks about how it's important to get antioxidants from your diet from whole real foods, like fruits, like vegetables. Okay, agree, 100%. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Um, but the fruits that she refers to, I believe it was pie, papaya, mango, and I think she even mentioned pineapple. All right. So you don't need to have uh, a master's degree in human biochemistry to understand that those are not the most antioxidant-rich fruits. So it, again, it makes me think that perhaps Jillian might need to freshen up on her nutritional biochemistry before going on national television, making a big stink about something that she clearly doesn't totally understand. When I think of high polyphenolic rich fruits and vegetables that do garner or do yield or pack a payload of antioxidant neutralizing, free radical neutralizing enzymes, I think of raspberries, I think of blueberries, I think of herbs like rosemary, I think of garlic, I think of onions, um, I think of even broccoli sprouts. I get all these things, at least on my channel, that is a primarily keto-based channel, I recommend to you. I'm not, you, no one's gonna get fat from eating a few blueberries here and there. No one's gonna get fat from having rosemary. No one's gonna get fat or kicked out of ketosis from having garlic, onions, ginger, um, curcumin. Those are much more enriched in antioxidants. I promote um, cooking with them, eating them, putting them on salads, putting them on meat, putting them on liver, putting them on whatever dishes you're going to make uh, in coconut oil, in butter, all that. 
I promote that. Like we promote that on this channel. Other channels I know do keto connect and so forth. So guys, we're not, the ketogenic diet doesn't have to be butter, lard, bacon all the time. You can have whole real foods, believe it or not. Um, and you can have some vegetables. You can have some seasonally available fruit. It's not this all or nothing thing where you have to have bacon, butter, lard, sausage, you know, pork rinds. That's, that's, you can be in ketosis that way. And I would argue that even that I, while I don't recommend or endorse eating that way, that's healthier than having a lot of carbohydrates. That would, that would just be my personal perspective. Of course, you know, we don't know. We don't have randomized placebo, double-blinded studies to support that. But so uh, what else? She does talk about the cell membrane. She talks about the cell membrane, how it's mostly uh, carbohydrates in your four macronutrients, protein, carbs, fats, nucleic acids, and so forth. But we know our cell membranes are mostly fat, phospholipid, omega-3s, for example, from fish, from nuts, seeds, from avocado, from olive oil, uh, from grass-fed meat for, for that. Um, omega-3s do enhance the fluidity of your cell membrane. You're not going to get enhanced fluidity and associated reductions in sudden cardiac death uh, eating a, a high-carb diet that she recommends. So I could go on forever. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed this video. Hopefully, you got a few nuggets if you like the science like this, you can always subscribe to my channel. We interview a lot of experts in the space, not just keto folks. We talk a lot about functional medicine, whole body health. And I very much appreciate you tuning all the way here. I hope you like this video. Hit that like button. If you have any comments that you'd like me to address or any disagreements, please challenge me on all my videos. Uh, I'll be following the comments below. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next one. Peace.